Welcome back to Tactical Insight, everyone. Arsenal suffered their first Premier League defeat of the season to Newcastle, of course. Did have a bad week, getting knocked out by West Ham in the Carabao Cup and did lose to Lons as well. So the third defeat of the season. And while we can talk about the defeats, there's a fluidity issue, there's an attacking issue, plenty to break down that has come out of a game that, look, Ulta was defined by fine margins. Of course, people are looking at the officials. We know Arsenal and their club statement certainly feel that way. But there is an issue with the way Arsenal are playing football, attacking. We are not playing the kind of football we were playing last season. And that is the sole focus. I say sole focus. That is a big focus of today's show with my good friend Graham. Never nice to be here having to break down a defeat, especially after it's been two days and you're thinking, I just want to get over it. But this is a very data heavy show, probably more data heavy than many others, if you can actually believe that, um, because there is a lot to break down that really supports the evidence that a lot of people are driving with that also are not attacking the way they were last season. No, and I think what we're going to get into today is the way uh, things have changed for Arsenal this season, which was highlighted in this game. Uh, I think when you look at this game overall, uh, controversy aside, we saw a team more solid mm. than last season. He's brought in players that have made us more solid off the ball, but it's been at the expense of what we do on the ball, and we've been less fluid going forward. Uh, and we're going to look at those issues today, James, mm. uh, in breaking this game down. But I have to say, I have to start with uh, strong words from Mikel Arteta after Saturday's defeat. That was our first in the Premier League this season. Uh, he called the Newcastle goal an absolute disgrace and he was embarrassed to be part of that, he said in his press conference. I've never seen him that angry after mm. a game. And the club came out over the weekend and supported his stance. Uh, and I think whatever you think, and we're going to go into... We want to really, this is a tactical show, so we want to talk about tactically what Arsenal did well and are not doing well. But I think you have to acknowledge that the game was lost on Saturday by that decision. It was lost on that decision, I wholeheartedly agree. But it's not the reason we didn't get three points. And I think that's what we've got to explore and build in this. Let's just give everyone some of the blanket information that you know we'll all know. Eddie Nketiah led the line. I called for Trossard and some others. I'll explain a little bit why. Kai Havertz in for Martin Odegaard, who was missing uh, due to an injury. Some rumours that it might be due to the fact that he maybe shouldn't have played against West Ham. But listen, that's just speculation. Apparently, it was happening. It happened in training. That's kind of the more official word that seems to be going around. Tom Yasu in for Zinchenko, who did start in the Premier League against Sheffield United. So that's the 11. And it produced a match that, I mean, by the way, Newcastle had some injuries, but I mean, not really much to say there. A good 11 that went out. LaSalle starting at the back where it would have been Botman if fully fit. But let's go through the match stats. Newcastle had nine shots to Arsenal's 14. One on target each. One on target each. Anyway, uh, we had about 60% of the ball, 400 passes there, 271, and a 0.62 XG for Arsenal to Newcastle's 1.23. I will say, I don't think that's a reflection of the amount of chances Newcastle created. It's just you're going to get a very high XG when a ball is on the goal line for Gordon to smash it in the back of the net. So I think that's what skewed that there. Their XG bit. was 0.16 if you take that goal off. Well, <laughs> Well, there you go. Doesn't that tell you everything? OK, uh, attacking stats. And we're going to delve into this in a lot more detail in a little bit. But 28 final third entries for Newcastle to our 71. 28 deep touches to our 43. Zone 14 touches. Turkish's favourite. Um, actually, no, Field Tilt's his favourite. I'm mentioning it because he's, uh, he's behind the scenes watching this. 69.3% uh, Field Tilt for Arsenal and 31 zone 14 touches. Again, tells the story in terms of maybe we look more the aggressors. Arteta alluded to that. We looked like, only, I think he said only one team wanted to win the game. Sure, I'll give you that. But then let's read through these as well. We had 14 shots. It's the eighth time in the Premier League this season that Arsenal have had less than 15 shots. 72% is the percentage of matches this season that Arsenal have had fewer than 15 shots. 0 0.6 expected goals in this game is our second lowest this season. One shot with an expected goal value of over 10%. We had zero big chances in, in this game, the fourth time this happened this season. 0 0.04 uh, was Arsenal's average chance quality in this game, the second lowest this season as well. And 14th is Arsenal's rank amongst all 20 Premier League clubs for non-penalty expected goals this season. Those numbers just aren't good enough, Graham. I think the numbers are not good enough overall, and we're going to go into that today. Yeah. I think the, the reason why the numbers were low in this game was because of the way Newcastle played this game. They almost, for me, played like the away team. Mm -hmm. uh, Arsenal played a very solid back line. We know that, yeah. White, Saliba and Gabriel. 
So with Tommy Astu coming in, we didn't have the normal Zinchenko inversion into midfield. Mm. And I think we need to talk today about the way Arsenal are struggling to build up from the back. But overall, Newcastle made this a very physical game. It mm. was always going to be um, a very low scoring game by the way that they, they set their stall out in this game. Yep. If you look at the last three games between Arsenal and Newcastle in the Premier League, Last year, they became the first team to stop Arsenal scoring in the Premier League with a nil-nil draw at the Emirates. This season, I think they've become the first team again to stop Arsenal scoring in 17 games. Mm. So they literally set out to play Arsenal in a very, I think, a defensive style, and they make it a very physical game. So this was always going to be, I think, a very low-scoring game, James. I agree. Now, we've got the defensive stats. I nearly missed them last week. I haven't forgotten this week. Um, But the reason I want to actually just deviate from what's going to be the main part of the show, which is talking about Arsenal's lack of fluidity, just to give some credit to these defensive stats where, okay, cool, they made more tackles, level on interceptions, pass up a defensive action shows that we seem to press them a little bit more than they pressed us. The big thing is I actually thought, well, I will give credit to Arsenal, and I thought they didn't deserve to lose a game, which, you know, is some going. You know, they're a Champions League side in Newcastle, they finished fourth last season. Where I do want to give credit is I felt that they weren't overawed by the atmosphere at all. They weren't overrun in midfield. They didn't shirk the physical battles. For everything we didn't do very well on the ball, there was actually, and by the way, when I say on the ball, I mean in the final third. In the first two phases of the game and in build-up, I just thought we were fine. In the final third, we lacked. I want to give Arsenal credit for actually having a really good defensive shape. Did they switch off a little bit on the goal potentially? But I actually felt that Arsenal throughout did what was required defensively and off the ball to, to, to beat Newcastle. And it has been a strength of this season, in my opinion. Though we've conceded some silly goals, and you sent this through, which I thought was interesting. Best defensive this season in terms of XG conceded. Man City have conceded 7.62 XG to Arsenal's 8.08. Newcastle third with 11.12, so quite a big gap between second and third. Shows you that Arsenal and City are leading the way in terms of the best defences this season. I think the reason for that was, James, towards the back end of last season, we started leaking goals. If you look at the running at the end of last season, we conceded three at home to Southampton, Mm -hmm. three at home to Brighton. We lost two goal leads at West Ham and Liverpool. I think this shaped his thinking. I think he wanted to move to a better structure off the ball defensively. uh, So we weren't conceding so many goals. I think that's the reason why he brought in Declan Rice, who's absolutely one of the best off the ball players in the league. Mm -hmm. Havertz, he's he's using him more off the ball than he is on the ball in my opinion. So we've we've become very good off the ball. And also, Tommy Asu is a a much better defender than Zinchenko. So he he is almost like he can play left back, he can play uh, um, centre back 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 as well. So you've got our four best defenders there, White, Saliba, Gabriel, Tommy Asu makes us more solid. So I think that is what he, he wanted to do this season. Uh, and why we've become sort of like better defensively. I think mm-hmm. it comes from what we started conceding at the back end of last season. I agree. So defensively improved, I agree. There's a fluidity issue though, which we've touched on. We said, we said this could be the big part of the show. Now, I'm going to just rattle off a load of stats. We're not going through all of them, but there's a lot of depth and detail and data that we have got that supports that Arsenal. There's, there's something they're not doing right when it comes to actually breaking teams down and playing that kind of electric football we saw last season. Whether it's by design or not, the point is we're not doing it. Now Arteta might think, yeah, that's fine. I know we've taken away from it. But as Arsenal fans, we love the excitement of last year. And this season we're really struggling. And I want to try and explore how we can try and rediscover that a little bit because there's got to be a balance. Now, we've got Arsenal's attacking stats in the Premier League per game last season compared to this season. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them, but In every single metric, we've gone down. XG, shots, key passes, passes to the final third, passes into the penalty area, progressive passes, shot creating actions, uh, penalty area touches, and attempted take-ons. Every single one is down per game. Every single one. And you might say, because you're looking at them, hit pause if you want to read all of these, but there's not a lot in it. 1.89 down to 1.75 in terms of XG. Shot creating actions from 27.5 per game to 25.8 per game. You know, you're probably thinking there's not really, there's probably not that much difference between, you know, last season and this season. But if you project those, if, if you stretch them out over a whole season, you actually start to realize that we're on, we're currently on course at the end of the season to accumulate an XG of 
basically six less than last season. We're on course to have 60 less shots than last season. We're on course to have 40 less key passes. We're on course to have 30 less passes into the final third, 30 less passes into the penalty area, and almost 100 less progressive passes. Over a 38 game season, it seems like actually that does stretch into quite a big drop off in terms of attacking stats. Now, let me show you this as well that comes from the analyst and Opta. Arsenal's zones of control. And when you look at it here, we talk about zone 14, which is this area of the pitch outside the penalty area. You can see Arsenal, the blue areas mean Arsenal have control. The grey areas means it's contested. It's kind of, you know, either side, it's neutral. And red means Arsenal don't have control. Now, we don't have control of zone 14. That D, that D area of the penalty area at the moment where your 10 sort of operates, where your false nine drops in. But we also don't have control of any of the left, left or right half spaces of that side either. Where Erdegaard, Xhaka, Jesus are having a lot of fun, we don't have control. Man City are at best neutral in those areas, but seem to be controlling the left half space, as you can see from this graphic. Then Tottenham are, are controlling the right and left half space and are neutral in that zone 14 area. Why is that? Why have Arsenal not been able to get control of those areas? Something that Arsenal did so well last season. And it's not just a case of, well, it's difficult to. Tottenham and Man City are doing it. We are actually losing the battle in the zone 14 area at the moment. You know, I think there's a number of reasons for that. Um, I would say if you look at the game on Saturday, uh, we had no Thomas Partey at yeah. number six. We had no Odegaard right-sided eight. And we had no Gabriel Jesus, who are three of our most um, able players to sort of like make things happen in those parts of the pitch. I think there's also an issue, I think, personally, with the way we build up from the back. And I, and I think this is, we're not getting the ball forward this season quick enough to our number eights. Mm -hmm. I think last season we averaged something like uh, nearly three direct attacks per game, somewhere between two and three direct attacks per game. And that's down to just over one now. We are struggling, I think, in the number six position without Thomas Partey. I think Thomas Partey's influence, I think, is a major reason why, or his lack of uh, game time in that area. Because remember, when we played him at the start of the season, we played him right back. He's somebody who, when he takes the ball at number six, when you pass into him, he's somebody who can break lines, and he's someone who can progressively carry the ball forward mm. to make team shape collapse. So, so what we saw on Saturday with Newcastle, was they literally stopped us through the centre of the pitch. Yeah. So uh, I think Danny Murphy made a big thing on Match of the Day about how hard their wide players work back to stop Saka yeah. and Martinelli. If we move Saka up there and we move Martinelli out there, you can see, you know, uh, you know they, they, they've got sort of like players mm -hmm. coming across to cover them, right? And, and, and particularly, he, he, he talked about how hard Gordon Amiron Amir worked back to assist their fullbacks, mm -hmm. which is true. But what teams are doing now really well, and this is a big thing, is they're actually blocking the centre of the pitch. Mm -hmm. So what you're finding is that they're, like their three centre mids on Saturday were blocking the middle of the pitch. Mm -hmm. Gordon is very narrow, yeah. out of possession, as is Almiron. So they're mm -hmm. set now to stop us playing through the middle of the pitch. Yeah. The moment we go out wide to Saka or Martinelli, they will mm -hmm. drop out wide to assist their fullbacks, mm -hmm. and then they will smash Saka straight away. Smash yeah. Saka. The moment he goes out on Saturday, but burn in the first 10 minutes, smashed him twice. Yeah. Got away with it, no booking. Uh, and, and Martinelli, I thought, had more joy on the left-hand yeah. side. But principally, they're stopping us playing through the centre of the pitch in that mm -hmm. shape. So what you need from your number six, which Jorginho can't do, which I don't think Declan Rice can do as well as party, is you need a number six who can break lines or, or sort of like progressively carry the ball to move them out of shape. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I think we haven't we missed Thomas Partey in that position. Jorginho is a good number six, mm -hmm. but he's not a quick player. He's somebody who can't sort of like drive through lines. He's not pacey. Mm -hmm. um, Rice, I think, doesn't like mainly this position. He prefers the left hand side. So Zinchenko was Zinchenko not playing on Saturday. Tommy Asu was coming in there, but he's not as effective as Zinchenko. Mm -hmm. So we have a problem, I think, getting the board the ball forward quickly enough to our number eights through the mid centre mid. Mm -hmm. That's a problem, I think, when you haven't got a number six like Thomas Partey. I think Thomas Partey's miss this mm -hmm. season in that position has been a major reason why Arsenal have been struggling to get the ball forward quickly to Odegaard, yep. uh, which is one of the reasons why Odegaard's been less effective. But also on the left-hand side, I think Havertz hasn't quite as been as dynamic mm -hmm. 
uh, in that position, or even when he played on Saturday, although he had one of his better performances, he hasn't got that dynamism. Yeah. So I think there's a, a, a build-up issue from number six. Teams are congested in the middle of the pitch, forcing us to go out wide, and we're going to show, I think, graphics today show we use the, the, yeah. the, the right side more. Uh, but we're not going so much through the centre of the pitch. I think the, the, the percentages through the centre of the pitch have dropped from something like 38 down to 33 this season, which shows to me that teams are blocking the centre of the pitch, stopping us playing through there. I think what you need to do, you need a number six who's going to break a line, engage a forward, and then move these people out of shape. And if you, they're able to sit here, James. Yeah. They're, they're comfortable blocking the centre of the pitch. Well, we've got data from the Optanis. This was going into the Newcastle game that had Arsenal ranking bottom of all teams in the Premier League for actual percentage of attacks down the middle third. That's 22.3%. The likes of West Ham and Luton around us, Man City, Tottenham and even Everton around 40 yeah 40 percent in the top three. Arsenal not going down the middle in the way other teams are. Now I also want to show this is Eddie and Ketty's heat map because it's not just about going down the middle it's about fluidity it's about moving into changing of positions now Eddie and Ketty are in this game in fact let's just get the 11s back up uh, where is it here we go now Eddie and Ketty no wrong one apologies here we go Newcastle versus Arsenal right Eddie and Ketty we know likes to occupy this area now what I'm going to say about Eddie is I actually want to give him and Havertz a little bit of credit people might think really they tried, I, and that's all I can ask. And this is going to sound really horrible. If they're not good enough, they're not good enough. If they're not good enough or, or a suit for a certain opposition, fine. But they tried. They tried to do what was needed in the game, and they really struggled. But Eddie Nketiah, he has played for Arsenal long enough for us to know that he doesn't want to always run the channels. He can sometimes, but he doesn't always want to interchange. He wants to be in the penalty area. He wants to be close to goal. He wants to be occupying defenders as best as possible. Now, I've got here, I'll show you, his heat map in this game against Newcastle. And you can see the main orange zone is much more central. Getting to those areas that, fun enough, we were just saying we don't feed the ball into enough. Of, I wonder whether that's a trust thing. You know, is Eddie getting to areas that actually were not designed to feed the ball, but I think you're right, it's more Thomas Partey's and actually there to sort of feed through the lines. Let me show you Jesus' heat map from uh, the game against Newcastle last season when we won away from home, drifting out to the left, coming into those left areas and interchanging and, uh, and, and ensuring that you're constantly asking questions of the Newcastle defenders. Now we saw two chances, now neither of these are the goals against, um, against Newcastle last season, but I just want to show you this. Now this comes from a long ball, but look how narrow Saka, Martinelli, Jesus and Erdegaard all are. They're all narrow here. Jesus, uh, Saka's come all the way over to that left-hand side. Jesus is wider than Martinelli. But this is just called instinctive play, interchanging, having fun going forward. And in this attack, Erdegaard makes the darting run, but Martinelli makes the run to support as Jesus stays out wide, rolls it into Martinelli, who cuts it back for Erdegaard and forced a great save out of Pope. Watching it, you might all now remember that chance. But again, Erdegaard, central and driving into those attacking areas. We didn't see this once from Kai Havertz. Not his, I say not his fault, maybe it is his fault, but I wouldn't even expect that really of him. And then you've got this other chance away at Newcastle last season. Arsenal just playing out the back. They've played all the way around. I think we even recreated this when we did Tactical Insight yeah. during that 2-0 win. It comes to Zinchenko. We're inviting them all the way up. But what does Erdegaard recognise? That pocket of space there. That one error that we have just said Arsenal aren't dominating. According to the Opta Analyst stats, we are not controlling those areas of the pitch like we did last season. Erdegaard runs off Willock into that space, re receives it from Zinchenko. And as he gets it, it's a lovely little touch. Rolls into Martinelli, not Jesus, not Eddie Nketiah. Where's Jesus? He's out wide here. And this is the thing that I think Arsenal are missing. Again, just show it as he gets this ball and Jesus is hugging the touchline. It is difficult from Cher and Botman to know who's picking up Martinelli because going into the game, neither of them had a plan to pick up Martinelli. Why? Because Jesus has drifted left, though he is normally occupying that space. Runners in beyond, getting into half spaces and playing through balls through the lines. I felt those openings were there on the weekend. I thought Arsenal could have still di uh, done this, but I don't think we had the players to do it with Havertz in this Erdegaard role and Nketiah in this position, not drifting out and, and mixing up with Martinelli. And therefore, we didn't have that fluidity and we made it very 
very easy for Newcastle. Even when we did play through their first line, play through their midfield, I don't think we asked the defence anywhere near enough questions with our moving off the ball. I think you're absolutely right, because uh, what Gabriel Jesus offers you off the ball uh, and on the ball is far superior to what Eddie can do. He can change positions with uh, Martinelli, as you say. Mm -hmm. Martinelli can come inside, Jesus mm -hmm. can go out wide. Eddie's not so good at that. And I don't think Havertz can go out wide if Saka wants to come inside as effectively. Agreed. So there's, there's, there's parts of the team that are not working. I think a key point I would like to add also on this debate that you've raised today is, is almost like the game states, mm -hmm. state of the game. So what we saw last season with Arsenal, we started fast in a lot of games, scored a lot of early goals. And once yep. you do that and you take the leading games, then the team have to come more out of their shape. So yeah. what you find is that they, we were able to sort of like go more direct because they were coming forward more uh, and we were able to play through the lines more easily because of the game state. We were leading in games mm -hmm. and they were having to sort of like open up more. Mm -hmm. All the time we don't score an early goal and I can't think of many games this season when we scored in the first half hour, maybe... Yeah. I think the opening game of the season, possibly Forest. Forest. We were, uh, and, um, that came after the 24th minute. Yeah, think, yeah, we haven't been scoring early, certainly not in the first 15 minutes mm -hmm. of games. No. I'd like to see the stats on that. But all the time you don't score an early goal and the game stays in that drawing phase at nil-nil, teams don't change their shape. So yeah. they continue to block the middle of the pitch. And I think that's been one of the things that's been happening this season with the team. Yeah. Um, I think what I would really like to talk about, I know we're going to talk about, is the role of Bakaya Saka in this team now. Yeah, well, let's get to him actually in a sec, because just before we do, to round all of this off, and I, we're just here presenting problems. I actually want to show, have I got it here? Uh, no, I haven't. OK, let's just bring up Newcastle versus Arsenal. I just want to show, forget the Newcastle side of things for now. Let's just get the Arsenal 11 up. Cool. I want to show the changes that I'd be making for Sevilla on the weekend, because it's very easy when, for us to... Wednesday night, you yeah, of course. There you go. I'm not used to this Champions League thing. Um, the reason I want to go through this is because it's all it's very easy for us to just sit here and go, this is wrong, that's wrong. OK, what would we do differently? Firstly, David Raya, if you want to keep him in goal, fine. I, I would change for Ramsdale. He did very well last season. Familiar with the back four. Another mistake from Raya for me in this goal as well. Neither are really claiming the position right now, but Ramsdale, apart from one error at West Ham, I don't think has done too much wrong. I then take Tomiyasu out of the eleven, and I bring Zinchenko back. I'll explain why in a sec. Havertz, bench, sorry mate. Fabio Vieira, get him in. And then this might be a weird one. Jorginho I'd take out, and I'd get... Can you see Elneny anywhere? There he is. I'd get Elneny in. I know he's barely played, but he's got legs, he covers ground more similarly to a Thomas Partey. And then in Ketia, I'd take out the 11 and I'd get Trossard through the middle. Now, the reason I'm saying I'd go for this is because I want to do our best to recreate these attacking patterns that we saw last season with at least players of a similar profile. Have Zinchenko in build-up like he did really well last season. Have your back three in build-up as well. And then get, let's move Gabriel along slightly, and then get Vieira trying to replicate what Erdogan was doing last season. Getting in the pockets, playing one-twos with Saka. Get Trossard coming into these spaces. We were just talking about the areas of the pitch that were not dominating. Let's get Vieira, Trossard and Declan Rice, who quite frankly has been brilliant whatever you've asked him to do. So why not ask him to do this as well? Um, get them into these pockets. You've got quality here that can actually do something in those areas that can make teams sort of struggle that can pull defences out of place like you said can make defensive structures collapse this is the 11 i'd go with against severe would you do anything different if odegaard's fit like you're bringing in odegaard i'll take it yes but i'm assuming he's not would i do anything different i, I wouldn't bring in El Nenio for fine game. Jorginho. um i'll probably you know i i, I look i would play Declan rice at six yeah and I would bring in, I would bring, if, I'm, I'm hoping that Odegaard's going to be fit and we can move the air over there. Cool. Or, does it, or, or if you, so and I'd, you bring, and I'd bring in Odegaard. That's if he's fit. If he he's is. fit. Cool. Um, so that you go for this and build that, up. That's, that's what I would like to see. Yeah. Or, you know, and I think, I think that Odegaard could even play on this left hand yeah. side. He, he came on against West Ham and, and, and scored from that position. So there's yeah. an argument he could play over there even. Mm -hmm. And maybe Vieira could play over there, whatever's their best uh, um, positions for mm -hmm. them. But I agree with you, the, the dynamic of Trossard mm -hmm. and Martinelli. The reason why I like it is you're 100% right because I think 
I think that, that our two most explosive players are Martinelli and Saka, mm -hmm. and we need to get them closer to goal. Trossard, more than Eddie, can come out here. He's brilliant on the left, and even Martinelli can go down into the yeah. centre forward position. Mm -hmm. I like that. I really do like that. Uh, but for me, it's what we do with Bukayo Saka at the moment so is, that, is, is, is the real question. Let's talk about him. We've got some numbers here against uh, Newcastle. One shot in the game, and it was a poor shot, a blocked effort, when there's loads of players around him. I don't know why he took that effort on. Uh, zero key passes, uh, eight completed passes into the box from open play, and only two progressive passes. He really struggled to get into the game. How much of it is it his bad form, and how much of it is it to do with Arsenal and our new attacking shape because Martinelli hasn't been at his very best this season either. What do we put it down to? I mean, we've got this as well, the percentage of attacks um, in terms of thirds on the pitch, this is all comps as well. And we, you know, you make the point rightly that it's gone from 29% on the right to 31% the season after that, to 34% last season, to now 38% this season. We're relying on him more and more and more every year. And that takes the toll on a young player. His numbers are still pretty good this season. I think he's coming back from injury. But I think teams now realise more than ever that he is our key player. Yeah. Uh, and he's, he's, he's in the zone here all the time, tight to the touchline. And what they're doing now is, is they're literally just crowding him out. Yeah. So they're crowding him out. So they're crowding the middle of the pitch, almost like inviting us to go out to him. And the moment we go out to him, three players will go straight across. Mm -hmm. And the fullback, the moment he gets the ball, the fullback's up his arse straight away. Dan Byrne on Saturday, literally, was kicking him from the first minute. He was, yeah. And he got away with two, one of those challenges, two challenges, one which I thought was a yellow card at, at best. You know, so, so teams have worked out that Arsenal are going to go to Saka and they are prepared for it. There's no, I mean, Danny Murphy was saying that Eddie Howe would have worked on this all week. He's some sort of genius. I could have done that. I could have set that Newcastle team up just as well as Eddie Howe. I'm, I'm not a coach at that level. But all he did was recognise that Saka was our best player and he, mm. he put something in place to stop it. He blocked the centre of the pitch, made sure when it went out to Saka, he had all the players over there to stop Saka. Mm -hmm. So the thing is now with Saka, I think we need to think about how we use Saka. Yeah. Possibly against Seville even. Seville are going to come with, a, I think, a block. Mm -hmm. so, so, and they'll be sort of like working out to stop Saka all week. I think we have to think about how we get Saka closer to goal, even if it means him coming out of this right-hand side a bit. I mean, we, yeah. at the moment we've got Ben White goes high. Mm -hmm. I'm more in favour now of using Ben White as, we an, have, as an overlapper and Saka playing more inside yeah. in that sort of half space. Mm -hmm. If Odegaard's not going to be there particularly and we haven't got a creative player in that position, I want Saka, who's, let's face it, he's our most explosive player. He's got the best mm -hmm. close control. He's got a shot on him. I want him coming in here and having shots at goal. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to think about very carefully how we use Saka now. And I think particularly if Odegaard's not going to be in that uh, right half space. Yeah, I completely agree. Let's just give some shout out to two players who are excellent. Declan Rice with 73 touches, 89% pass accuracy. That's completing 51 of his 57. Um, long balls attempted. He, oh, no, he completed four long balls, two successful dribbles, one where he ran right at the heart of Newcastle's defence created an opportunity for us and did well defensively too. I thought William Saliba was fantastic as well. Gabriel was good too, but we've got some William Saliba's numbers here. 90% pass accuracy. Again, just have a little read. Two clearances, two an interception, a tackle. He did very, very well. Before we round off the show, Graham, um, I do have to get your take on the VAR decisions. Um, Habits, just red, red or yellow? Do you know, when I saw it real time, I thought he could be in trouble there. Mm. Uh, I, I think it's an amber. I think it's close sure. to a red. The f I think when I watched it back, the fact that he caught him more with his trailing leg, I think, saved him. I don't know how much the referee saw that. The referee, I think, had they left not it to VAR. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So so basically, and I think we've got a problem with referees now that, that when situations are develop, developing on games, they make decisions thinking oh, I'm going to go to VAR because yeah. VAR can check it. VAR will sometimes stick with the referee's decision on the pitch. He sent it to VAR because he doesn't know whether it's sure. right. He, he, he just sort of sits on it. I think I'll go to VAR. Mm -hmm. They're thinking, oh, he's made that decision. So no decision's made. And that yeah. was the problem in this game, I think, on a few occasions. That for me was not close to a red, not quite a red. And I think an hour, it's certainly a yellow. Yeah, I thought it could have been. What about Gimmer Rise? Red card all day long, wasn't it? I mean, Gimmer at the end Gimmer. of the day, you can't go... He, he literally ran around on that pitch and I think he lost his head yeah. after that challenge. I think mm -hmm. Newcastle... They're a very physical team. They like giving it out, but they, they bloody don't like taking it back. No, they, they don't. They, they, they don't. So agree. the moment that, you know, that I, agree. when that Havertz incident happened, 
Okay, it was a bad tackle, but Byrne had done one on Saka earlier. Yeah. They all rushed across and pushed him into the crowd. That was so out of order. Uh, you know, they, they'd lost control. The referee rightly booked him. He could have, you know, taken even further action. They, they then, and then Gamera's, mm. Gamera's uh, uh, lost his head after that. Mm-hmm. He literally ran round then just trying to kick everybody. And when mm. he couldn't kick everybody, he went after him and tried to elbow him. Yeah. And that's what he did with Jorginho. That was yeah. a straight red card. And Agreed. I think VAR looked at it. If they should have sent the referee over to the monitor mm-hmm. and he should have made that decision. The problem, I think, and I think Robbie highlighted it really well on the bias show earlier. I was talking to Robbie this morning when I come up here. Was the P, the vast, the, the referee, PGMOL, yeah, yeah, the, the PGMOL, the, the, the referee in, who's looking at that doesn't want to throw his mate under the bus because the moment he sends him over to the screen, he's he's going to look at anything. I've got to have to send him off here, and then he's the crowd already rolled about the habits thing. He's going to be. Yeah. You know, really lynched by the fans for the rest of the game. The, the referee was under enormous pressure on Saturday night. Yep. I have to say it was a difficult game to referee, yeah. but he had to send him off for that and he didn't. Yep, agreed. Okay, and then finally the Gabriel Joe Linton incident that leads to the Newcastle goal. Well, I understood why they um, said the ball, they couldn't make a decision on the, mm-hmm. on the ball because mm-hmm. the ball was still in the stadium, James. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, that's just a joke. But at the end of the day, I, to the naked lie, to the naked eye, the ball was out. I saw yeah. it on the screen. I, that was out to me. I saw it in the naked eye. Mm-hmm. So it was out, but okay, they played on. But when that ball comes across and, and Joe Linton challenges Gabrielle, he's over him with two arms on the back of him. They have to give that as a foul. You can't make a subjective decision, oh, that's not strong enough force. That is, he's got two arms on him. Anywhere else on the pitch, that's a foul. And I think the problem I had, they had again was they should have sent it upstairs. Well, sorry, once he had gone upstairs, they should have sent the referee over to the monitor. But they didn't want to do that because it would have been awkward for the referee. I, Robbie made a great point again about Mike Dean made a, uh, a statement on, or, or, or in an interview on Sky where he said, I didn't want to throw my mate under the bus. And that's in effect, I thought, what they were doing on Saturday night. They bottled that big time uh, because that was a no-go. I can understand why Arteta was absolutely mad. I'm absolutely not convinced that Gordon was onside either. And if you look at the offside rule, there should be two players with the goalkeeper. There should be t- two players behind the behind the keeper, shouldn't there? Mm. Uh, and there wasn't. So look at that offside rule. Um, so and they, they're saying, well, they couldn't make their mind up because they couldn't see it. Was, <laughs> look, I think they went with the on field decision because it was the easiest decision to make. Mm-hmm. But I can understand why Arteta was really upset. That goal should have been wiped out on Saturday night and, and, and you know and that's my view on it Fair enough the roundup stats what have you got for us? I've got very little this week No, fair enough <laughs> well, to be fair I mean we've rattled through so much in just one show but um, I mean I think it was about time we really had the fluidity chat go yeah. on take it away This was the first time Arsenal failed to score in their 17th game this season in all competitions James Arsenal managed only one shot on target in the game and managed just two attempts in the last 30 minutes after conceding which shows you how bad we were. It's another great. Create. That's another great. And one. finally, James Eddie Enketia made his 100th Premier League appearance for the club. Congrats, to Eddie Enketia. That's a, that's a, that's a great, like, it's a fantastic achievement. Whatever, I think, I, whatever I think about whether he's the right player to play in this Arsenal system and and bring others into play and give us that fluidity and you know complete this diamond, you know, that gives us control of midfield. Whatever I think, it's not his fault. He's getting picked every week. He's just doing his best to do what he can, and he's got 100. You know, appearances for Arsenal. We had, so that, debate to him, we had that debate last week, didn't we? But I have to say, he's only scored five uh, away goals for Arsenal in something like 52 appearances. He hasn't scored in his last 18 away. We gave him credit last week for his hat trick against Sheffield United. But clearly, the debate there where we need a new striker in January is now going to be Rumbles ignited on. on the fact that we can't seem to score. Mm-hmm. And he's the striker. And when you play up front for Arsenal, you play up front under real pressure. And uh, I think those numbers demonstrate to me that probably. We I think Arteta might have to look for a new striker mm-hmm. in the window. If not a new striker, somebody to come in like a Neto. Someone that sure, another, to... another forward exciting yeah, option. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Agreed. All right, everyone. Big thank you for joining us. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this. If you enjoyed the analysis, obviously you won't be happy with the result. But 
What I would say is plenty of opportunity now for Arsenal to bounce back. If you look at the upcoming nine games, there's an opportunity for Arsenal there to build some momentum. Desperately need Arsenal to get going now because we've had a little bit of a stop-start season, but we are still within touching distance of the teams around us that we want to be competing with. So lots to build on still. Subscribe to AFTV if you haven't yet. Get in the comments section. We'll be there. Me and Graham. Graham's always there as well, giving some other thoughts as well. Replying to some of yours. So make sure you uh, let us know any of your thoughts in the comments below. Catch you next week.